Welcome back. This is lecture four in the Israel and Prophecy series, part one. Where are the Israelites today? Are they to be found among the Anglo-American people in the late 20th century? That's the premise of this series of lectures. But where did this idea originate? Where did it come from? It's a remarkable idea, but it's also an idea that's been largely rejected, largely unbelieved, and very few within the scholarly community would find the idea acceptable today. When did it originate, and why did it catch hold when it did? Those are the questions that we'll begin to answer in this fourth lecture, and then in probably the fifth, and perhaps even the sixth lectures to come. What we're going to do today is to take a look at the historical context in which the notions, in which the idea of British Israelism, as it's probably most frequently known, um, really began to develop. The first serious, serious published material began to appear around the middle of the 19th century. Uh, the first really credible book-length work was one done by a man named John Wilson, and he published, although he lectured and researched in uh, years prior to the date of publication. He published that volume in the year 1840. Before we take up the issue of Wilson and the many others who have written in this vein, written this genre of British or Anglo-Israel literature, we want to take a little bit of time and look at the historical context in which that material appeared. In many respects, you find the mid-19th century to be a time of racist, imperialist, intellectual climate, and in terms of the religious context, the historical backdrop against which British Israel ideas begin to appear, you have in many respects an Adventist or a pre-millennialist religious environment. Now, if you've not already done so, you want to take out your workbook and turn page 11, <clears throat> and here you, again, we, we have the assigned reading, uh, a couple of selections, actually just a couple of pages from the uh, work by Raymond McNair, America and Britain in Prophecy. Uh, if you've not yet read this, you'll want to do so certainly before you get too far into this series of lectures on the history of the idea of British Israelism. Uh, also today, we'll cover at least to some extent or another uh, about the first half, or maybe a little more, or maybe a little less, uh, in terms of the questions that you see out of the 11 that we have for uh, this third unit, the history of the British Israel idea. There are three main strands that I want to take a look at and discuss briefly before we actually get into uh, an examination of some of the British Israel uh, authors and the literature that was produced uh, to develop the idea. Uh, it's not really accidental, I suppose, in one way, that uh, in 1859, a man named Charles Darwin published a volume that really shook the intellectual world of Europe. Um, in the long run, it, it provided a context or a framework in which much of our education uh, the way it's presented today is framed. The volume, of course, was Origin of the Species. And many others followed in Charles Darwin's path. Uh, there were those who not only applied the concepts, the ideas underlying evolution, to the animal kingdom or the animal world, but they also applied it very aggressively to principles in human society. Uh, social Darwinism, as sometimes it's known today. Those concepts of evolutionary theory um, applied very broadly and with some fairly unattractive and ugly results or outcomes. Now, the idea of British Israelism was born and it grew to maturity in this intellectual climate that was very heavily tainted with ideas of evolution and also ideas of racial superiority. Now, it's no great surprise then that many people have come along and co-opted or seized upon the idea of British Israelism and used it to promote what are essentially racist ideas. I want to go back, though, for just a moment, and if you have a Bible, 
you want to take that out and let's again look at a couple of passages at a couple of scriptures along the way which I think are quite relevant to us in this particular discussion. I want to examine the question, is this idea inherently racist? Because that's one of the most frequent and common criticisms of associating uh, not only the Anglo-American peoples but really any people associated with uh, the, the ancient Israelites described in the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, we talked a bit about this a lecture or two ago, but just to reiterate and kind of set the tone or the pace. God had to start somewhere. In Genesis chapter 12, and as I've mentioned several times already, this is the touchstone, the point of departure, that section of Scripture where the Abrahamic promises or the covenant that God made with Abraham is described. God called Abraham, or Abram, verse 1 of chapter 12, Now the eternal God said to Abram, Get you out of your country from your kindred and your father's house unto a land I will show you. Was God a respecter of persons in selecting Abram? No. God simply had to start somewhere to initiate or to begin a plan which would eventually expand and encompass the whole of humankind. Galatians chapter 3, it's worth our while to shift focus to some of Paul's writings here in the New Testament. Galatians 3 and verse 8. And Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, or those people outside the pale of physical, material, national Israel, that God would justify those people through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In you all nations shall be blessed. Is God a racist? As Mr. McNair's uh, little inset article uh, asks, no, he's not. If you'll drop down again to verse 14 in this same chapter, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, and that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So the ultimate reward is by no means limited to national, physical Israel. Uh, just as Abraham was a place to start, so national, physical Israel likewise was a place which God chose to start. Another interesting insight perhaps can be gained if you'll take a look in Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 24. A story in which we find Jesus Christ being approached by a woman at the well. Verse 21, let's begin there. Jesus went there and departed unto the coast of Tyre and Sidon, and behold, a woman of Canaan, someone outside the Israelitish community. She came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, you son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a, with a demon. Verse 23, he answered her not a word. Was Christ racist in the way that he approached this? And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, because she cries after us. And notice then what he said. Bear in mind, before we read the words of Jesus Christ, that God has a time order. He has a plan. He has a sequence. It's mapped out in a blueprint that's given, actually was given to Old Testament Israel uh, in, in terms of the, the ancient holy days, given to the, the Israel, of the physical national Israel of God, and observed today by the churches of God uh, when we come together in the spring, uh, the late spring or early summer, and again in the fall to, to celebrate uh, those uh, three seasons or festival seasons that are God's feasts. Um, verse 24, Jesus answered her and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. And then it goes on to develop that particular theme. But the point here is that, yes, salvation is indeed open to all humankind. But it's in God's good time, in his own way, and in a certain prescribed order. Uh, another passage uh, as well from the writings of Paul that's worthwhile looking at at this juncture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 
in verse 23, it says, but every man in his own order. Christ was the first to be resurrected, then the first fruits that are Christ at his coming. And yet then in a general resurrection <laughs> later downstream. Another way perhaps to look at this and frame it and put it in its context is to pose the question, if, if we, we asked, uh, is, uh, is the British Israel idea inherently racist? That's the same kind of question as asking, is Christianity inherently violent? Now, the record of history is quite clear. You can take a look at the Crusades. You can take a look at the Reformation period. Uh, in 16th century Europe. Um, you can, depending upon you who you look at, depending on who is practicing Christianity, uh, one could come away with a very distinct impression that <laughs> whatever this book prescribes as a way of living is, is something that I don't necessarily want because it's too violent. It creates bloodshed. It creates friction and difficulties and problems among people. Uh, and yet we read the Sermon on the Mount, the principles that are outlined about how to relate to one another and how to, to relate to God. Uh, and indeed, we, we I think have to, to admit, true Christianity is not the violent Christianity that we sometimes seen, uh, have seen practiced uh, as it's written in the historical record. Now, yet another issue, which we can take a moment or two to, to look at, has to do with the charge that's sometimes made, that how could a God who is not a respecter of persons um, bless one particular nation and not another? Well, it's God's prerogative to give the blessings of the earth to whomsoever he pleases. Let's just take a look at another couple of passages to lay the framework and the foundation. And we'll go on from there. Uh, Psalm 50, the principle that's articulated here is that the earth and all its fullness belongs to God. It's his call. God is sovereign and he will dispose of those things which are his in whatever way he pleases. Psalm 50, and let's begin in verse 10, for every beast of the forest is mine. Now think of that in terms of some of the prophecies that we read, I believe in the last lecture on uh, coming out of Genesis, the 49th chapter, about those blessings that were going to devolve upon the head of the descendants of Joseph. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. For I know the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. And we read, if you'll turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32, we read in Scripture, in Deuteronomy and again in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, Deuteronomy chapter 32 first though, we read where God has a plan. He has a certain configuration which he intends or expects uh, humanity to conform to in terms of the places on this earth where the different peoples, uh, which go back, I suppose, at one level to the Tower of Babel, when they disperse to their different parts uh, and places on the earth, God intends that various nations take on an inheritance in various specific places on the face of the earth. Verse 8. When the Most High divided the nations, their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Does that make Israel better than other nations? On the contrary. Uh, in fact, if you'll keep a finger here, in Deuteronomy 32, let's just take a look at Deuteronomy 7 and verse 7. The Eternal did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people. Indeed, you were the fewest of people. And there seems to be a principle here, uh, which is echoed in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, that God 
seems to take a special delight in a challenge. He takes great pleasure in taking not the mighty, the famous, the rich, the well-educated of the world, but taking the poor, taking those who, who might be less comely, and making first something out of them. If anything, uh, Israel's primacy in receiving these various blessings seems to be a function of, of the way that God operates in work, working first with the weak and foolish to confound the mighty. Meanwhile, back in Deuteronomy chapter 32, it says, breaking into the context of verse 8, God set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the eternal's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. It was a place where God began to unfold the plan of salvation. In Acts, the 17th chapter, we see a kind of New Testament variation on this theme. And if you look at verse 26, Acts chapter 17 and verse 26, And he, God, made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. And he has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. It's God's prerogative. What God wills that he will do. Now, is that fair? Well, it's God's choice. He can do whatever he wishes to do with those things which belong to him. Now, the saving grace, let's go back to the book of Deuteronomy. This time, Deuteronomy chapter 4. If it were that God merely set apart Israel for a special blessing to the disadvantage of all the other peoples and nations of the world, then perhaps we could make those kind of allegations. The charges would hold, uh, let's say, a greater weight. But the very purpose for Israel's selection revolves around moving all nations in the direction of, well, national greatness and ultimately uh, eternal salvation. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. We see in this that the reason that God called and set apart the Israelites of ancient times was to create for himself a model nation, a nation whose behavior would form a pattern which the other peoples of the ancient world could imitate, could follow, and then they, in the wake and in the train of Israel, could rise to unparalleled heights even as the Israelites themselves were able to do. Let's take a look. If you'll drop down to verse 5. <clears throat> Behold, I've taught you the statutes and judgments, even as the Eternal my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land where you go to possess it. Keep, therefore, and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes, and then they'll say, Surely this great nation is a wise and an understanding people. It was for the benefit of other nations who would have occasion to see someone in the international community do things the right way and reap the benefits of godly behavior. Verse 7, For what nation is there so great, these people will say, who has God so, <clears throat> who has God so close unto them as the, the eternal our God is in all things that we call upon for him for? And what nation is there so great and has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? You see, Israel was given resources, it was given benefits, it was given blessings so that it could serve as a national model of godly behavior. All the nations were to imitate that example so they then would receive the benefits just like the model. A couple of passages, both coming from the Old Testament prophets, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 20. God's intention was never to exclude it was to bring in successive stages each nation to the place where they too could enjoy the blessings and the benefits derived from living a godly lifestyle. Um, 
let's, uh, Zechariah is the passage actually that I wanted to go to. No, I'm sorry, that's, that's right. Okay, uh, Isaiah 19 uh, is the passage we'll start with in verse 23. Again, it speaks of specific nations, but in principle, it applies to the peoples of the world. It's in God's major plan and the direction that he intends to lead the people of the world. In that day, a phrase which connotes in the time when God will set up and establish his kingdom, his rulership on earth, a time when the kingdom of God will rule in a direct way, uh, which it really has not uh, ever since the closure of the tree of life uh, when Adam and Eve made their mistakes in the Garden of Eden. At that time, in, in that day, shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria. And the Assyrians, they will come to Egypt and the Egyptians into Assyria, and the Egyptians shall, shall serve with the Assyrians. In that day again shall Israel be a third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land. And what a remarkable prophecy. You see, <coughs> these nations had great antipathy toward one another in much of their relationships uh, across the span of ancient world history. And Isaiah predicts and prophesies a time in the very historical context, I might add. Isaiah is speaking when Assyria has run amok, has created all types of international problems and difficulties for the people of the, of the Levant, the people of the Fertile Crescent region. Uh, Assyria is not a nation that you want to reckon with or deal with. Uh, they, they're a military power given to wanton, in some case, destruction and deportation of populations and the like. And yet in that historical context, Isaiah says to the Israelites who read this and to all people who read it today in, in uh, Hebrew scriptures, he says there's going to come a time when Israel and Egypt and Assyria, will, they'll get along with one another. They will be moving in the same direction. They'll be, as it were, on the same page, the page, if you will, of the Bible. Verse 25, of these three nations whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people. What a startling declaration. And Assyria, the work of my hands. And Israel, mine inheritance. Those things will fall naturally into place once God's kingdom is planted and established uh, and set up here on this earth. Zechariah chapter 8. in the Minor Prophets <clears throat> toward the end. Zechariah chapter 8 likewise makes a very startling declaration. Thus says the Eternal of Host, in those days, and here again as in the prophecy that we read in Isaiah, those days are in direct reference to that time during which the Kingdom of God will be set up and established upon this earth. It will be a time when, if, if we read and understand prophecy correctly, Israel will be given, and I mean by this physical national Israel, will be given the opportunity once again to do it right, only this time with the aid of God's Holy Spirit. And they will finally be able, empowered by the Spirit of God, to set the example, to be the model for national behavior that the whole world can emulate. And indeed, as the Spirit of God spreads around the globe with the influence and direction and guidance of God's kingdom here on earth, people will realize the difference. And finally, after millennia have passed, Israel will fulfill the role that we read in Deuteronomy chapter 4 of being the model nation, the model people that God sets apart to show the way for the rest of the world and to bring the rest of the world to the greatness, to the blessings, to the benefits, to the joy, peace, happiness, and prosperity that you find starting first in Israel, but ultimately to girdle the globe. Then in those days, verse 23, it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations. Everyone no one is excluded. God is not a respecter of persons. Even they shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, an Israelite, and they will say, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Great, magnificent 
prophecies of things that are yet to come. Now, the fact that some, and perhaps many and maybe even most, British Israel writers have presented information in an irresponsible or in a racist fashion, that should bring discredit not upon the concept, not upon God's word or his prophecies, but upon them as individuals, as them as writers who have applied in a wrong-headed fashion and way the central core or concept of an idea that is sound and, of course, biblically based. Now, leaving the element of racism behind, the second thread that we find, uh, which is part of this matrix of uh, our context, the historical context, in which the British Israel idea, uh, in essence, was born, grew, and flourished and took on, if you want to put it this way, full form. The world of the 19th century, particularly if you were British, and even to a certain degree if you were American, that was a world of imperialism. The imperialist idea held great power, influence, and sway as the Anglo-American peoples moved through the 19th century. The 19th century was a century of British and to some lesser extent United States ascendancy. Uh, it was a time when it would have been quite logical for not only people in the United States and the British Commonwealth nations, but people outside observers for, from all over the world to perceive the, the British, to perceive the Americans to some extent as a chosen people. There was a saying in the 19th century, and it was used as much by people outside of the British Isles as it was in, that God is an Englishman. The expression of speech betrayed the outlook, the attitude, the idea that in some peculiar providential way, the people of England had received some blessing that was inexplicable. And based on what we understand and read in Scripture, that certainly seems to be the case. The British people had acquired an empire, as it's often said, on which the sun never set. They built, in fact, the greatest and the largest empire on record to that point in world history. Uh, the British ruled about 25% of the, the world's population. Uh, they had direct control over about 20% of the Earth's landmass. And in terms, of course, of indirect or economic influence, uh, the, they exercised power, <coughs> influence, and control uh, over a lot more than that. The 20% of the landmass which they did control tended to be the choicest parts of the entire globe. Now, some critics claim that British Israelism in the 19th century, the idea which began to be expounded around the 1840s, and as the century wore on over the next six decades, an idea which took pretty firm root and hold in many quarters. Um, the Victorian middle class in England, uh, if, if they didn't embrace it as a doctrine unto salvation, they certainly found it, at least many in Victorian middle class society, found it as an interesting, fascinating curiosity this element of prophecy which captured the imagination of many people in that strata of British society during this period. Um, many people claim that fascination with British Israelism was the natural upshot or the outgrowth of a people who felt guilty about what they had done in leaping from one point to the other around the globe, gobbling up various stretches and pieces of real estate. They believed that British Israelism, by stamping God's imprimatur on the imperial process, justified what had been done. It was a salve, if you would put it this way, to a guilty national conscience. I want to make one thing clear, and uh, again, I come at this out of a background uh, where my main research interests and my re main research um, uh, in, in various libraries and on projects and topics through the years in terms of historical studies has focused on the British Empire and British imperial studies. 
that particular notion, which is oftentimes cited by the critics of British Israelism, and you'll find it in much of the literature that's, that's critical of the idea, it is anachronistic. It is out of place and it's out of time. Yes, there was an anti-imperialist uh, concept or idea uh, that indeed gained momentum, but that really didn't come until after British Israelism as an idea had gained its foothold uh, within the, what the ideas among Victorian uh, British society. Uh, the the anti-imperialist sentiment really is dated after the beginning of the 20th century, oftentimes coincident with the writing or publication of a book by John Atkinson Hobson called simply Imperialism. Hobson went to South Africa, uh, surveyed the landscape politically, economically, socially, and came back to the British Isles and produced a book which in many ways is really the, the point of departure for the anti-imperialist sentiment and attitude which has grown and gained momentum uh, during the 20th century. Those who lived in the 19th typically saw the empire and the whole imperial process as a very favorable, positive force in the world. It was an opportunity, although self-congratulatory and probably very egotistical and oftentimes not welcome by the peoples who were subject to British imperial rule. It was viewed as a positive force, an opportunity to make the world over in their own image. The British had a sense, as it's sometimes called in the historical literature, of missionary imperialism, well captured, I might add, by one of the poet laureates of empire, a man named Rudyard Kipling. Uh, Kipling wrote a very famous poem uh, called The White Man's Burden. And if you ever go back and read that particular piece of English literature, what you'll find is that there is a spirit there of going out and trying to serve, trying to help, trying to elevate. We'll come back at later uh, points along the way and analyze some of the flaws and fallacies in that particular reasoning. But those Britons of the 19th century, from mid-century uh, to the century's end, those Britons were fairly proud of what they'd done imperially. They might not have known where Fiji was. They might not have known the location of various far-flung imperial territories in Australasia or Africa or elsewhere. <coughs> but they believed that they were doing the world a service. So that particular critique projects a 20th century anti-imperialist attitude on a 19th century people who by and large were really quite enthusiastic uh, about and very supportive of the empire which they had built. Across the Atlantic Ocean, another thing that merits mention at least, in the 19th century, from around, again, the 1840s on, you have the phenomenon, going back to um, a famous American journalist whose name was John O'Sullivan, <coughs> he coined the phrase, and from the time in, I believe, 1848, when he first wrote this uh, in an article, the notion of manifest destiny became powerfully popular in the United States of America. It was an idea which in essence brought together several strands of thought, uh, one being that God himself, that providence, favored the territorial expansion of the United States of America, that it was in God's, uh, or that it was God's will and in the best interest of the people who lived across the, the expanse of, of the North American continent, uh, that the United States gained control of that region so that the U.S. government can facilitate the spread of democracy and then provide an outlet for its rapidly uh, increasing populations, uh, um, uh, an open territory where that population growth could expand and fill. So British Israelism then was one idea in the 19th century that helped the people who lived, who inhabited, who occupied at that time it helped those people make sense of the world in which they lived, of Britain, of 
what was going on in the United States, of the entire international setting of that particular day. Now, the third strand that I want to take a moment to develop before we take a look at some of the specific individuals who contributed to the flow uh, of, of, and the development of the British Israel idea would be the religious environment in which British Israelism was born and began to grow and flourish. In England in the 1840s, you have a movement which is known simply as the Oxford Movement. Um, uh, simply and perhaps ruthlessly uh, explained, the Oxford Movement was a religious revival. It sought to revitalize, to infuse the Anglican or the National English Church with a new vitality, with a new energy. And it sought to do that by subtly, on some occasions, and not so subtly on others, reintroducing traditional Roman Catholic Church ritual, practice, teachings, and doctrine. And it led to no small stir and no small controversy. In fact, there were those who were Anglican clergymen who eventually left the Anglican faith and took on the faith of Roman Catholicism. In the midst of that debate, there were a group of individuals uh, prominently known as the Tractarians. And that name derived from their use of the printed word to try to promote doctrinal positions and ideas. Uh, for those who may be watching this lecture series coming out of a Church of God tradition, uh, you may think back to some of the literature produced by one of the branches of the Church of God back in the 1950s and 60s and even on into the 70s. Little tracts, oftentimes small, not, uh, not book length, uh, not magazine size, um, but small, hard-hitting um, statements on doctrinal positions that could be easily distributed and easily circulated. It was in that kind of a context, a religious context, that the British Israel ideal, uh, I British Israel idea gained momentum uh, and began to grow. And oftentimes, British Israel exponents adopted and used that particular style. Uh, it was within the context of the religious world of, of that period, time, and day. Now again, across the Atlantic, <coughs> it would be worth our while to take at least a momentary look at what was going on in the world of religion in the 19th century United States. The 1840s, around the time that John Wilson <coughs> launched his inaugural work, um, you find that the United States was going through the final decade of what was commonly known or is known by historians in our day and age as the Second Great Awakening. Uh, simply put, it was a revival that swept through the United States. It had probably its principal and greatest impact in many ways, at least theologically, uh, in the southern United States, and it resulted in the birth of multiple new United States Christian denominations. Uh, many of you probably come out of a background uh, of a denomination that, that was born or created in the midst of this Second Great Awakening movement throughout the United States. One prominent figure was a man who was a Baptist minister, and his name was William Miller. He was, or he became, one of the main founders of the Adventist movement here in the United States. And Miller, others as well, but Miller rode the wave of growing interest in religion in the United States to promote a number of different ideas which made him a very popular and a fairly well-known figure in uh, the 1840s in uh, religious society in the United States. Uh, Miller's focus, along with the focus of many others who were a part of this movement, was on the Second Coming, and most who focused in that regard believed that that return of Jesus Christ was imminent. We were at the door, uh, almost as though, uh, you, almost in the way that you read in Revelation uh, chapter 3 of some of the prophecies uh, about those churches in, in Asia Minor. Um, they focused typically on the prophecies that were to be found in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation. 
Now one of the grand conclusions that Miller arrived at through his understanding, by his lights and uh, through the way he saw and understood and interpreted these prophecies, specifically in the book of Daniel <coughs> and, and especially in Revelation as well, he concluded that, that the return of Jesus Christ was destined to take place in the year 1843. And those who surrounded Miller, uh, who clustered around him, uh, were greatly disappointed when that did not happen. Uh, in recalculating the various dates, the Millerites, as they came to be known, came to the conclusion that since there was no year zero between 1 B.C. and 1 A.D., the date that they had selected was a year off, and they waited again with great expectation and high hopes in the year 1844, uh, once again to be disappointed. The Millerite movement, as I've already mentioned, of the 1840s was coincident with the beginning developmental stages of the ideas of British Israelism. Uh, Miller's focus and the focus of uh, the Adventist denominations, which sprang up uh, as the great disappointment of 1843 and then again in 1844, uh, created difficulties within uh, the, the Millerite group. Um, the focus on the return of Jesus Christ promoted, nonetheless, a mentality that was very receptive to ideas such as British Israelism. One of the reasons that that proved to be the case was that most who looked at, who delved into the prophecies relevant to Israel, prophecies that, that 19th century men and women came to understand and believe to relate to end time events. Prophecies which predicted a great regathering of the Israelite tribes, a bringing together of the, the so-called lost ten tribes in union with the, uh, the tribe of Judah, uh, the separation dating from, the, uh, in essence, the 700s B.C. Um, in the book of Ezekiel, uh, prophecies were cited. looking to that time when God would take, as it were, or characterized two sticks, one representative of the tribe of Judah, the other representative of the tribe of Israel, and finally, in a millennial setting or context, bring them together after Christ had returned. People begin to wonder, in light of these restoration and reunification prophecies, where then are the Israelites of the northern kingdom. If prophecy is so clear about their role uh, in, in future events in the context of, of the establishment of the kingdom of God, they must be somewhere. What is the answer? Uh, where do we turn? And one answer was to identify Israel with the people who enjoyed world dominance in the very historical setting in which interest in these ideas and concepts began to take firm, deep hold. Um, granted, uh, as oftentimes the various critics uh, have, have observed, um, virtually every people among the nations of the earth have at one time or another been identified with, with the lost tribes of Israel. We'll spend the rest of this course uh, taking a look, <coughs> or a greater and more in-depth look, at why uh, the argument for uh, Anglo-Israelism or British Israelism has at its center a very important core of truth. Not everybody, in fact very few, would embrace the idea. I want to read a couple of quotes which I think, uh, although they certainly go against the grain of the main thrust and, and arguments that were presented in the, this lecture series, I want us to understand and understand very clearly that the notion of Anglo-Israelism, of British Israelism, is one which is in most academic circles uh, rejected, poo-pooed, uh, made light of, uh, and, and uh, ridiculed, laughed, if you want to put it that way, to scorn. One of the most popular authors of historical writings uh, in the mid to late 20th century has been a lady named Barbara Tuckman. Uh, she's written a whole host of books. One of the most interesting that I've ever read, and I do highly recommend it, 
for any who uh, would have time to, to explore more about this, is a book called Bible and Sword. It was, if I remember correctly, Barbara Tuckman's first book-length work that was published. And in the context of exploring the relationship between the British people and the Middle East, and she does that from the earliest times of recorded history all the way up to the establishment or the, the announcing of the Balfour Declaration in A.D. 1917. You find in the early going, it's page 82 on the particular little paperback volume which I happen to quote from here. She writes about the Anglo-Israel movement, describing it as a group who by a tortured interpretation of stray passages from the Bible have convinced themselves that the English are the true descendants of the ten lost tribes of Israel. She challenges, to put it in a bit more scholarly terms, the hermeneutics of discerning who and where Israel would be today from a read of scripture. Now, another quote, which is worth our while uh, looking at as we once again consider the historical context in which the British Israel idea developed, comes out of the Encyclopedia of American Religions. And this author writes, there is a definite correlation between the rise and fall of those ideas by which this author means British Israelism, uh, or, pardon me, British imperialism uh, on one side of the Atlantic and manifest destiny on the other side of the Atlantic. There's a definite correlation between the rise and fall of those ideas and the popularity of British Israelism. The dismantling of the British Empire has had a devastating effect upon the movement. Now, while that uh, prima facie may have a certain logic about it, uh, I'll just interject here, one could make the observation that if the British Empire has come unraveled and if the British Kingdom uh, has fallen to a second-rate status in terms of its power and influence in the world, certainly the same cannot be said about the United States of America. The United States, uh, at least to date, and I speak on, in August of 1997, remains the premier power of the world. And at least on the face of things, it certainly doesn't seem uh, like, that certainly doesn't seem to, uh, likely to change any time in the immediate future. Well, time will tell. But the notion has been criticized from, from many uh, over the decades. And it, it is not held in high esteem. Uh, in terms of its scholarly integrity, in terms of, of its appeal. Nonetheless, there have been a lot of people through the years who have examined and explored and developed the idea. And at this juncture, with about uh, seven or eight minutes, what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about some of those who have contributed to this discussion. We'll continue on in the next uh, one or two lectures uh, and explore in greater depth and detail the various ones who have added their contributions, uh, put different spi uh, spins or twists on the British Israel concept or idea as the decades have rolled by. Now let me s step out of the flow of the discussion momentarily and share with you just a little bit of my background to to tell you how I've reached the various conclusions which I'm going to offer to you in this particular part of the lecture series. My conclusions are the product of some extensive resource uh, or research search conducted primarily uh, in the early 1990s. Um, I spent a good bit of time in the United States Library of Congress and if you ever have occasion to do some of this kind of research on your own, uh, it certainly is the finest research facility uh, in North America for providing the literature that's been produced on the subject. And the literature is vast. It is expansive. The bibliography, which I compiled uh, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, uh, and, and it is by no means exhaustive, and it is not updated in terms of the literature that's been produced from the, uh, the early 90s up into the mid uh, to late 1990s. It is uh, over 100 pages in length alone, listing books, not 100 books, 
but a hundred pages just listing the different volumes who in one way or which in one way or another have made contribution to this discussion. Most of that can be found in the United States Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Um, virtually anyone can walk in and have access to that material if they're able to make it to Washington. Uh, during that same time period, I had occasion to visit two other major East Coast libraries. Uh, well, more than two, actually. Uh, Yale University is the repository. It houses some of the finest British Israel literature that you'll find available uh, in, in terms of that which has been produced, especially in the 19th century, but also in the 20th. Uh, the libraries, the different ones at Yale, um, provide uh, a really nice collection of the literature. Their Judaica collection in the main library as well is quite beneficial and helpful in this regard. The Theology Library at Harvard University is another example of, uh, of a location which provides uh, an abundant uh, number of resources. Uh, so if you ever have occasion to, uh, to go in there, uh, you'll find a treasure trove of resources on the subject as well. Then in the early 90s, again, I, I had occasion to spend about a week and then on subsequent visits uh, a, a few other days as well in the reading room at the British Museum. Uh, the museum, uh, which is a, a large complex oven by itself, also at the moment still houses the British Library facilities. Uh, by the time you, you hear this, the library itself may have been moved uh, they're in the process of, of transferring uh, their, their volumes or their collection from one place to another. But the old <coughs> reading room, a uh, circular uh, room within the British Museum, is on a par and in some respects is better than uh, the, the United States Library of Congress in terms of providing the facilities and providing the volumes, uh, which in, in many respects, if you want to look at the British contributions to these writings, um, yeah, there, there are volumes there that you simply would not be able to find uh, here in the United States. Then lastly, down in a little town called Putney, which is, oh, I suppose, about 25 to 30 miles south of, of London. Uh, I guess you could even describe it as part of the greater uh, metropolitan London uh, complex of, of cities and towns. There is the British Israel World Federation headquarters. They, up on the second floor of their facility, have as well a marvelous library, which is exclusively British Israelite literature. Uh, a wonderful collection. Uh, and if you w would want to do research, uh, if you live in the British Isles and have easy access to, to Putney out of Greater London, uh, it, it comes highly recommended and has some marvelous works in its combined collection. Now, this in essence is the introduction, and I've got us now to where I'm going to begin answering some of those questions that I introduced a few moments ago, well actually almost an hour ago now. Where did the idea originate? And if you read the various commentaries on the idea itself, what you'll find is there are many references to works, some of which go all the way back to the 16th century. Uh, you have oftentimes a frequently cited reference in things like the uh, uh, Encyclopedia of American Religions or some of the respective Jewish encyclopedias. You'll have a reference to a counselor, Le Loyer, uh, a man who supposedly wrote a book called The Lost Tribes in 1590 that proposed this British-Israel connection. Uh, I found no copy of that volume in my research uh, over the past decade or so. Another man is referred to by Helen Van Wolderen uh, who has written a book which associates uh, the, the Dutch people with the tribe of Zebulun, which incidentally is a good volume of and by itself. But she makes reference to an Adrian Van Schriek, also an author of the 16th century, and uh, says that his work traces Dutch origins back to the Hebrew people. Her documentation, sadly, is lacking. And again, I've not been able ever to find the actual volume produced by this individual. Uh, another frequent reference to an 18th century author. Uh, he goes, depending on the, the resource that you found his name cited in, uh, Dr. Abade of Amsterdam or Dean 
a body from Ireland. Uh, the, the work is Triomphe de la Religion, uh, or Triumph of, of Religion. Uh, I have not uh, ever encountered this uh, in, in my own researches. I do, however, uh, have the quote that is frequently attached to that work, and if it's out there, it is indeed a remarkable conclusion. Uh, it, allegedly, in 1723, he wrote these words. Unless the ten tribes have flown into the air, they must be sought for in the north and the west and in the British Isles. That's cited in the, Ameri or the Encyclopedia of American Religions in a little article that they have on the subject of British Israelism. Uh, another author that is sometimes referred to is a 17th century figure whose name is John Sadler. Uh, Sadler, we know this much, wrote in 1649 a little book, a pamphlet of sorts, called Rights of the Kingdom. And I've held that in my hands in the British uh, Library Complex and gone through it with a colleague. A little biographical information on Sadler himself. Sadler was a student of Oriental literature. Uh, he was a member of Parliament. He came from the district or the region of Cambridge. He was a very close friend to one of the most powerful political figures in all of British history, namely Oliver Cromwell, who during about a dozen years or so uh, held political control and sway in England. Um, Sadler was also a proponent for Jewish re-entry into England, something no doubt motivated or driven by his understanding of the prophecies of where the Jews would be at the time of the return of Christ or the Second Coming. And he lobbied vigorously with Oliver Cromwell, trying to trip the political switch to allow the Jews to come back into the British Isles. Now, the volume itself, Rights of the Kingdom, does make certain references associating the English people with the Israelites. But upon careful examination, my own conclusion is that this volume makes this association in a way that is not intended to be literal. 17th century Englishmen, in particular, uh, in the context of the religious tumult and turmoil in the Civil War, which rocked the British Isles around mid-century, those people were far more attuned to biblical allusion than those of us who live in the 20th century might be today. Uh, Sadler, I would argue, uses his references as a literary device rather than being an early precursor of the British Israel idea. We'll draw closure at this point, then, to what we have to say on the subject today. And when we come back next time in Lecture 5, uh, we'll begin to explore a little more about some more recent exponents, uh, individuals who uh, gave support to the notion of connecting the ancient Israelites with the British and American peoples of today.